Hi, I'm Tom Marks with the Marks Law Firm in Orlando, Florida, and welcome to the Healthy Family Law Attorney. Today, I have a special guest, somebody I have known for a lot of years, Steve Chong. Steve and I actually were partners in a law firm before we started Marks and Chong back in 1992. So it's been uh, a lot of years. Steve and I are still good friends. Steve is a corporate real estate and estate planning attorney. He's a shareholder at the law firm of Mature and Harbert. He's board certified in real estate since 1994, and he's a frequent lecturer um, and author on legal issues within his area of expertise. He's AB rated, which is the highest rating you can get on Martindale Hubble. Uh, Steve's just a, a good family man, very involved in his church, very involved in the community. Um, again, we've been friends for years and he's got a lot of expertise he's going to share with us today. Hey, Steve, how are you? Great, great. Good to see you, Tom. It's always great to uh, work with you. Yes, and I really do appreciate you and I appreciate your expertise in the area of the corporate and the real estate and the estate planning because those are issues that really impact family law quite a bit. So let's say I refer a, a client who I'm representing and a who owns a business, let's say, uh, to you and they're in need of uh, corporate advice. What is some of the advice you're going to give my client who's going through this divorce regarding the business, whether they're going to sell it, uh, try to keep it or whatever? Well, the first thing I would do is ask the client who owns the stock. And uh, rather than have them try to guess, I would prefer to see the actual stock certificates in the corporate minute book so I can see for myself what has been documented. There are times when corporations, especially closely held corporations or family businesses, when they're started, oftentimes the stock is in both the husband and wife's name. And the reason for that is because uh, if it's in both names, if one of the spouses dies prematurely, then the spouse would own all the stock in the company itself. Uh, but if that's the case, the how that's going to be treated in divorce court, I assume, is going to be a little different than if the stock is, let's say, 50% in the husband's name and 50% in the wife's name or some other percentage. So I would need to know how the stock is held. And then uh, internally, the corporate attorney may have done a what's called a shareholders agreement that establishes what would the price be upon a sale of one shareholder stock. So if there's a shareholders agreement already executed inside the corporation, you need to know what its provisions are so that there's uh, that becomes a framework for valuing, if you will, the shares and what the procedure is for one, one shareholder to buy the other out or for the company to buy those shares out. So those are two things that we would want to see, the corporate minute book, a shareholders agreement, so that we can investigate and see what the facts are. Beyond that, there may be issues of um, if the company is not going to be sold, which of the spouses is going to run it. Now, I, I anticipate that there would be a few instances where the husband and wife want to continue to operate it together because neither can afford to buy the other out, but that's probably fraught with problems or conflicts in the future. So that probably wouldn't be the first choice, but uh, then you'd have to ask who's best able to run the company? Um, is it possible for one party to buy the other out, et cetera? Right, right. I found it be, uh, to be very difficult uh, for a husband and wife to stay in the business and run it together after the divorce. I've, I've been in a couple situations like that, and we've had to draft really uh, significant documents to try to protect around that. But um, it, it normally doesn't work out. Let me ask you a question that um, comes up quite a bit. Uh, let's say I represent one of the uh, spouses and um, their spouse wants to keep the business and my client's fine with giving the business to the other spouse. They want to be free from any liability. Um, how do you do that? What are the concerns? Um, that can be accomplished if every other vendor that they've dealt with, that they've given a personal guarantee, agrees to give a release for the departing spouse. Uh, that's often difficult to accomplish, frankly. Uh, oftentimes when there's an initial office lease executed with personal guarantees, 
and there is a remaining term under under the lease, most landlords are not really uh, willing to give personal releases from guarantees. And the same thing can hold true for uh, payable trade payable companies where you're ordering supplies from a supplier and they say in order to open an account, you have to sign a personal guarantee. Unless there is a long standing history of good payment with that, that supplier, in many cases, they're not going to be willing to release that personal guarantee. So that's something you're going to have to plan on. And if you can't get releases from those personal guarantees, that's going to be a problem for one, one spouse to really make a clean exit. Okay, good, good advice. Um, let's say you have a situation, there are no personal guarantees. Um, is there uh, still a concern? So let's say my client signs uh, the stock over to the other party. There are no personal guarantees out there. Uh, does my client get the protection of, in case the corporation gets sued? And under most circumstances, the answer is yes. Uh, because the corporate veil is still in place, there would be protection unless there was personal involvement in a bad business decision approved by the spouse by that while that spouse was involved with the corporation. So that's it's a limited circumstance under which you can pierce the corporate veil and go after somebody, a spouse, for example, who's no longer associated with the company. Now, to the extent that they, the spouse who's staying in control of the company is financing any payments to the spouse who's departing, at, whether it's alimony or property settlement or whatever, then the spouse who's departing has a vested interest in the operation of the company going forward. So there may need to be some provisions that say, if you're going to continue to run the business, I need to make sure that I have access to the books and records. Uh, if necessary, I have the right to have a custodian appointed to serve on the board, uh, directors to manage the business or to oversee the management of the business going forward. So there needs to be some internal protections if a portion of the value of the company is being financed or paid over a period of time to the departing spouse. Okay. Yeah. And I remember that term from law school, piercing the corporate veil. So yes. it gets a little bit complicated. That's why uh, I like to send those corporate clients to you when they have those situations. Um, let's move on to your real estate um experience so what are some some of the issues that divorcing clients need to consider when they're selling the marital home in a divorce well if they're selling the home that's a good thing uh because if you don't sell the home immediately or in in short succession then you have that potential problem with a mortgage lender or other lien holders and then the question is well who pays for that and how is there going to be indemnification from one spouse to the other but if you're selling, it's important that you make sure there's an establishment or there's an agreement on who the realtor, for example, is going to be, what would constitute an acceptable price to accept. So there's not bickering over this price is not good enough or this price is not good enough or whatever. So establish objective benchmarks as to what price is going to be good enough, uh, which realtor we're using. And then with respect to repairs, because there's oftentimes repairs that have to be made prior to a to closing, how are, we, how are we going to share those? Is that going to be fronted by one party and then reimbursed at closing? Things of that nature. And who gets to approve the amount of the repairs, et cetera. So as long as those issues are kind of worked out in advance, it can be done. But if you don't do that, then you're just asking for problems later. Right. I agree. And that's the importance of having an experienced family law attorney who knows what provisions to put in the marital settlement agreement like you said, uh, choice of who uh, the realtor is, that the parties follow the reasonable recommendations of the realtor. Um, if, for instance, um, well, let's let's switch it around a little bit. Let's say one of the parties wants to stay in the house, and I know this is a different uh, scenario, um, but they're both on the mortgage, right? So I've seen a, I've seen agreements where attorneys have drafted and they don't really address what ifs? Well, what if the spouse staying in the house can't qualify for a new mortgage? They're supposed to refi, but it doesn't say what happens if they don't. And then, of course, uh, the client who moved out is still obligated on the mortgage. I mean, you've seen some of these situations, right? Yes. Yeah, you really do. It really does uh, require some a good attorney to try to foresee what could go wrong. 
I mean, the parties themselves may never anticipate, oh, we didn't think this would happen or that would happen. So they really do need to rely on attorneys who can say, we, we need to, to plan for every foreseeable or every possible problem that could come up, deal with it in the agreement uh, between the spouses so that when it happens, even though it wasn't necessarily anticipated by everybody, but if it happens, at least we have a plan to resolve it. We've, we've dealt with it in this agreement. So yeah, that, that happens where people have a change in circumstance, right? The, the party who's going to stay in the house loses their job or something like that. Uh, so then what, right? So if you plan for that uh, in put it in the agreement, then we know what to do. Right. It's so important to clearly uh, identify and define those um, requirements in the marital settlement agreement so it can be enforced by a court. Because if the court doesn't have anything in writing in the agreement to enforce, then you know, you're kind of out of luck. Right. So um, that's a, not a good situation. So let's avoid that. All right, let's go to your third area of uh, expertise or specialty or real experience, and that's estate planning. So what are some of the estate planning or wills and trusts kind of issues that family law clients need to consider? Well, at the very outset, they, they should understand they're going to need to redo their documents. The, the most important one is the will. If you're not, if you don't have, if you will, a surviving spouse anymore or don't want everything to go to that person, you're going to need to make arrangements with a new will with new beneficiaries. And in most cases, I think you're going to ask yourself, do you really want to then set up a trust for any minor children or, or potentially even adult children so that those people get the bulk of your estate, not your former spouse. So if you set up a trust for your kids, choose a trustee who's not your former spouse, then that's probably going to feel good. Uh, likewise, your advanced directives, your designation of healthcare surrogate, durable power of attorney, all those things are going to need to be redone, be redone with new fiduciaries so that your former spouse is not the person who's going to take charge of your, your assets if something bad happens to you. Exactly. I think that's that's important. So I like to tell my clients um, before we end the representation, once uh, the divorce goes through, your prior wills are really no longer effective, right? Uh, they can be effective because under the law, if you're divorced, your spouse is no longer the primary beneficiary and the law says that person will be treated as being predeceased. So the will in and of itself is not automatically revoked. It's, it's potentially amended. But by the same token, you're going to want to make sure that you get a new one anyway, just so that you can say, we're starting fresh. I, I've thought about now who my beneficiaries I want to be and who my fiduciaries are going to be. So your personal representative, your, your choice as a personal representative or executor or executrix, that's going to be someone you have decided in advance is going to be in charge of your estate and with control the distribution of your assets. Right, um, because most um, couples, uh, married couples, have what's, I guess, called husband and wife wills, and they're each other's beneficiaries, and obviously when they're getting divorced, that is gonna change. Correct, correct. Okay. So that'll change, and then also who the fiduciary would be, who's gonna make the decisions and administer the, your wishes under the will or your other uh, testamentary documents. All right. Fantastic. That's great. Um, okay. So this is the healthy family law attorney. So I've got to ask you the question. Do you have a healthy tip for our viewers today? Yes. Uh, we've gone through the last uh, 18 to two years worth of COVID. And while we're going through this COVID, a lot of attention has been self-focused, if you will, maybe not intentionally, but a lot of it, a lot of our energy has been focused in on how do I protect myself? Uh, what do I not do? And that probably can wear on you after a period of time. Um, and that's probably just not healthy for us. I think in order to combat that, we should intentionally do something for someone else, whether that that's praying for someone, making a meal for someone, sending another person an encouraging note, get the focus off yourself and focus on someone else for a period of time. And I think you're gonna feel better about yourself emotionally and mentally. I couldn't agree more. That is uh, great advice. I'll tell you, I read recently 
that speaking of being uh, inwardly focused, so many people are fearful of COVID and uh, the potential effects of it. You're starting to find that having anxiety and fear about the COVID or, or, or in, even in general um, is a very significant comorbidity up there with like diabetes or obesity or whatever. So yeah, getting your um, mind off of that, off of fear, off yourself and on others. That's great advice, Steve. Hey, thanks so much for being on the channel today, Steve. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Tom. I hope you and your family stay healthy and well. And yours too. Um, for our audience, um, if you like this, please hit that subscribe button, hit that bell icon. If you'd like to uh, get notifications of future videos, if you have a question for Steve or for me, uh, leave that in the comment section below. If you have an idea for a new video uh, that you'd like to hear me talk about or a guest that you'd like to see me have, uh, leave that in the comment section below. I appreciate it so much and have a great day.